So really cool new picture has come out. To be honest, it looks like a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> like the black part, and it looks like it's got a water stain on it or something. Or... So in fact, the black part was taken uh, by the Voyager space probe as it was wandering past uh, the solar system as it went past Io, one of the moons of Jupiter. But the orange stuff is the new stuff, and that was an image taken of Io, of this little bit of Io. This is a tiny volcano on Io. In fact, this is the most active volcano in the solar system. It's called Loki. This was an image that was taken recently of that volcano from the ground. And that's the amazing thing, that things that a few years ago we could only even hope to see by actually going and seeing them, you know, sending a space probe uh, and actually going up close to have a look. We now have the quality of images we can now take with telescopes on the ground means that you can actually see them from the ground. The scale here we're talking about is like a few hundred kilometres across, so it's on you know, a fairly small scale of things. And there are two clearly these two bright patches and this is kind of looks like a horseshoe joining them up. It's thought, and again it hasn't been analysed in detail yet, but it's thought that one of them is actually the erupting volcano itself and the other is that this is just this massive lava lake that forms and you can actually, when you have these lava lakes, just that you get the same kind of phenomenon on Earth, they tend to crust over and then the crust sinks and suddenly you see the lava again and so on. So what we think's happening here is that you're actually, it's one of the phases where you can see this massive lava lake surrounding the volcano. This is in the sort of near to mid infrared, so it's a few microns wavelength, so it's beyond the, the visible wavelengths into the infrared part of the spectrum, which is why volcanoes show up very well, right, because they're hot, and the, the, so these kind of wavelengths, the infrared is a very good place to look because you're really seeing the, that bright, hot emission. Well, it's an amazing thing, right, the, this idea that actually there are, we can take sensible pictures of geological phenomena on a moon of Jupiter from the ground is an amazing, the sharpness of the image, you need to be able to pick out this kind of detail on something so tiny, so far away, is absolutely outstanding. There's a couple of limitations to how sharp an image you can take from the ground, and in fact we've talked about these a few times before. One is that the Earth's atmosphere messes things up, and so actually that blurs the images, so you can't take very sharp images because of the Earth's atmosphere. The other is there's a fundamental limit that basically says that the, the sharpness of your image is dictated by the size of your telescope, and the bigger you make a telescope, the sharper the images you can make. And what this new image has done is basically sort of solve both of those problems in the sense that it uses some very sophisticated techniques to get out, both get rid of the effects of the atmosphere and to deal with this limitation of how sharp an image you can take with a finite size of telescope. Okay, so I have another picture for you. This is the telescope that did the job. It's a thing called the Large Binocular Telescope, or the LBT. How have I not seen that before? I thought I knew have all the telescopes. Okay, I, this I... is... It's in Arizona, it's on Mount Graham in Arizona, a joint venture by several countries that run this telescope. Each of these is an eight and a half metre diameter mirror to give you a sense of the scale of this thing. So it's a very big telescope, in fact it's two very big telescopes. What's a bit unusual about it is that they're not independent telescopes, they actually both point in the same direction. So they actually, you can combine the light from the two and either you can just use that combined light to look at fainter things because you've got more collecting area so you're seeing fainter things. But the neater trick here is actually you can combine the, the light from the two in a coherent fashion, which in terms of this sharpness limit, this diffraction limit for a telescope, means that effectively you've got a single telescope that's kind of the, the distance between the two of them rather than the diameter of each, each one individually. So the effective diameter of the two when they're working together I think is about 22 or 23 metres. I'm figuring out the angular resolution of this, this image is a very, very sharp image. You can see very fine detail, very small angular scales. It's about um, 32 milli arc seconds and I was doing, trying to figure out something that puts that into perspective. In perspective, you could see how many fingers I was holding up from my hand if I was standing 100 kilometres away from you, 60 miles away from you, um, using an image of that sharpness. So it really is picking out incredibly fine detail because of this very high angular resolution you have with this technique. Professor, if you stood 60 miles away from that telescope in Arizona and I swung it around and pointed it at you, <laughs> Would it see your hand? I suspect I probably don't emit brightly enough in the infrared for it to actually be able to record my emission. But certainly in terms of the resolution of the images, yes, it will be able to tell that. But it, I would have to be glowing fairly brightly in the infrared for that to work. So that's acting like one mirror, but it's pretty clear to me there's some pretty big holes in that mirror. There's a huge gap in between and above, and like, like that's like a mirror with most of the mirror missing to me. Yep. And it's actually, it's worse than that because it's, if you, if you think about it, it's actually bigger in this direction than it is in this direction, which means in terms of the sharpness of the images you get, the images are much sharper in the horizontal direction than they are in the vertical direction. And you've got all these gaps and so on. So there's a couple of, again, a couple of tricks you can play 
which is if you think about it, as you trace an object, if you think about a, a kind of an extended object, so here I am with my telescope looking this way and it's following this extended object. When an object, what happens to it is as time goes on, as the Earth rotates, it'll rise and then it'll set again. And if you look at the direction on my hand, you can see that actually at the start here, my hand is pointing kind of more or less upwards, then it becomes horizontal, then it points downwards. And so actually at different times, I can use this extra resolution the telescope has in the horizontal direction to tell me about different aspects of this object because its, its orientation is changing as it tracks across the sky. And so by combining images that you've taken at different times as an object tracks across the sky, you can actually use that extra resolution in all directions to get a sharp, an image which is sharp in all aspects rather than being squashed one way and you know, very sharp in one direction and blurry in the other direction. You can combine all those images together to create a single image of the object which is as sharp as if you had a, a single telescope effectively kind of, a, of this kind of size and round. Why do they even make big mirrors? Why don't they make every telescope like that? Because it's actually hard to get this to work. This is a, you know, it's a very sophisticated technique. This is probably the best image I've ever seen taken with this kind of technique. You do have this problem that you can't just take a snapshot. You do have to combine this whole series of images together. And then you've got to do all this fancy processing. The object needs to be relatively bright so you can do these kind of techniques on it. So there are limitations to it. There are still real advantages of having a, a single big telescope. But what this telescope is really giving us is kind of a foretaste of the sorts of things we're going to be able to do when that next generation of big telescopes comes along because already it's getting images of kind of the sharpness we would get with a single very large telescope. I've seen some pretty impressive images of Io taken by space probes that went to Io. I mean, surely that's, that's where it's at. I mean, that, you, you can't beat that, can you? You can't. And you can see the quality of the image we're getting, you know, where you're seeing things 100 kilometres across. When you actually got your space probe going there, you can see something which is one kilometre across or even maybe in 100 metres across. So clearly you get much more if you're actually there. Of course, the downside is it takes you a long time to get there. It costs you rather a lot to get there. Space probes are incredibly expensive. We have ignition and liftoff of Atlantis and the Galileo spacecraft bound for Jupiter. And the Sunnyvale flight director has just confirmed the successful deploy of the inertial upper stage and Galileo. Galileo is on its way to another world. It's in the hands of the best flight controllers in this world. Fly safe. And typically, if it's a flyby mission, you get one shot of having a look at things and then you're gone. Whereas here, with this kind of technique, we can actually monitor this volcano night after night, year after year, to see actually how is that structure changing, how is this most active volcano in the entire solar system erupting. If I gave you a big whack of money, or if Bill Gates gave you a big whack of money and said, it's purely your choice, Mike, do you want to build a space telescope or a huge array of these things, what would you spend the money on? <laughs> 